Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! First one is titled, How My Grandpa Became the Owner of a Gas Station Garage. My family immigrated America in the 1880s and settled in Nebraska. We were farmers for the first 80 years or so, but back in the 1960s my great-grandma decided she was going sell the entire farm before she died and simply give her sons one-third of money for inheritance when she passed, she had three sons. In 1969 my great-grandma passed, and her three sons inherited the money she had earned from selling the farm. My grandpa decided he would basically let that money sit until after he retired from the military. In 1971 he deployed to Vietnam for his second and final deployment. At the end of his deployment he returned to Nebraska and retired after 22 years in the service. Now he had an old Chevy truck at the time and was in the process of building a concrete business with the money he had gotten from his inheritance. Well during this time, his truck engine blew up. My grandpa was busy at the time and he didn't want to fool with the truck because he was busy. So he bought himself the engine he wanted to replace it with, which was an upgrade and he went down to the only garage in town and asked them if they'd be willing to put the engine in the truck. They agreed on a price, and told him to come back in a week or so. A week later my grandpa comes back and picks up the truck, he admits he felt like a fool for not double checking the work but assumed since this was the son of his friend that the son would do right by him. This was a small town. Well my grandpa opens up the concrete business, and he's busy, and it comes time for his first oil change. This is about 4 months after he got the truck back. He's doing the oil change and he notices that the engine he bought isn't the engine in his truck. It's a smaller engine. This obviously pisses him off to high heaven as my grandma liked to say. So he storms on down to the garage and talks to shop. Earl was the owner. Earl comes out, and denies any wrongdoing says he did as he was told, and it shouldn't have taken him four months to bring the issue up. My grandpa tells Earl he needs to do what's right. Earl refuses. It's important to note, this is a small town. Written contracts and so forth really isn't a thing. Your worth is your word. My grandpa tells Earl he's going get him for this. Earl laughs and tells him to leave his shop. My grandpa goes down to the county and requests the record for who owns the gas station. Turns out it's our old family friend named Harold. My grandpa stops by Harold's house and starts inquiring about the business deal Harold has with Earl. Harold says well Earl rents the gas station, garage from him. My grandpa asks Harold how is everything going and Harold confides that Earl hasn't paid his rent in two months. My grandpa asks, do you have a written lease with Earl? To which Harold goes, nah, I sure don't. My grandpa then asks, what if I bought the gas station, garage from you? Harold isn't completely on board with the idea, but my grandpa makes a strong point. Earl isn't paying his rent, Harold doesn't seem like he has much interest in being a landlord anymore, and my grandpa has the cash to buy the place outright. Harold sensing something is up asks my grandpa, did Earl do something to you? You seem awfully interested in this garage, ain't you busy with that concrete business of yours, and my grandpa fills Harold in on the story. My grandpa also mentions that he has a son, my father, who needs something to do, and he'd be happy to buy the whole building from Harold for a fair price, and what happens after that is his business. Also it's important to note, when Harold decided to rent this business to Earl, in that deal went all the equipment, and tools that Harold had acquired over the years so those belonged to the building. Harold and my grandpa came to a number that they both agreed on. A few days later my grandpa paid Harold in cash, in full for the business. The paperwork is done and my grandpa is now the proud owner of a gas station and mechanics shop. Now my grandpa senses that Earl ain't going be too pleased when my grandpa fires Earl. So for extra good measure my grandpa calls up the local sheriff who is a high school friend and asks the sheriff to come with him to break the news to Earl. So my grandpa and the sheriff go down to Earl's now former business and they walk in and before my grandpa can even say hello Earl says, now I told you, I didn't cheat you. My grandpa smiles and says, I'm not here about my truck, I'm here to fire you, Earl with a look of confusion on his face asks, you can't fire me. 
I own this business. My grandpa shows him the title and says, I'm now the owner of this building, to which Earl fires back, but I got a deal with Harold. And the sheriff speaks up, you do. Do you have a lease? Well no Earl says, to which the sheriff smiles and says, in that case, you're going need to take your stuff and leave. Earl is fuming upset, grabs his toolbox and storms out. My grandpa ended up hiring the mechanic that would occasionally work on his trucks at his concrete business. He had my aunt and grandpa run the gas station full time and my dad would work there after school. We owned that garage for 25 years before my grandpa sold it to someone else. Next one is titled, I unleashed the monster of bureaucracy upon my neighbor and watched it destroy him. This is a story of how patience is key and how letting someone else get revenge for you is by far easier than doing it yourself. The setup. I live in one of those doubled up houses where they build two houses adjacent OT each other with mirrored layout, so we share a wall but are otherwise completely separate. For years, the house next to me belonged to a nice old lady who you never really noticed or had any trouble with. When she died and the house was resold, the troubles began. The target is someone who I will refer to as Jack Sparrow, for reasons that will become clear later. Jack owns a sizable construction business, does some real estate on the side. He buys the house and rents it to a bunch of foreign construction workers that work for his business. I say foreign because it is relevant to the story. There are rumors Jack is doing some shady stuff to have these work for him dirt cheap by claiming that they're national workers in their native country and paying them according to that wage and not the much higher minimum wage of my country. Not exactly on the up and up. Possibly unreported labor as well. Anyways, he stuffs four to six of these in said house for them to live while they work here. Now I do not have anything against construction workers or foreigners. But these guys have two traits that are very problematic. They are extremely loud and they do not give a duck about anyone else. We're talking non-stop music and partying starting Thursday evening throughout the entire weekend, until they leave at 5am Monday morning to go to work. Seriously I don't know how or when they sleep, it is literally non-stop. We're talking, I'm wearing headphones but still cannot hear my own sound over their music, loud, since it would appear that they've designated the living room, adjacent to the shared wall, as the party room where the fun happens. At first, I do the neighborly thing and just suck it up, thinking, it's just one party, just one weekend. After the third one in a row, I go over to ask them to turn it down, since you know, night disturbance. It's technically illegal to blast music this loud, hearable on the street and across the street by my other neighbors who have also complained. I'm met with a half-hearted, so sorry, we'll fix. Except nothing changes. I go over several more times, each time angrier, each time met with, but it's not loud. If I can hear your music in my own house, over my own TV and music, I would say that it is in fact, too loud. I contact Jack, since he is their landlord, and explain the situation, after which I'm met with an abrupt, sorry not sorry, not my ducking problem. Basically Jack told me to get ducked. So I involve police, and call them every time things get out of hand. After about a dozen calls, sometimes even twice in the same night it is clear that even regular police interference doesn't help the situation. I should mention that I am a lawyer, so I know what the next legal steps are. I also know that other than a token paper from a judge saying, their music is too loud, I'm not really going to get anything. Things would, like they already sometimes had, become a cat and mouse game where they would blast their music extremely loud to upset me or to wake me up, for a few brief moments, so that by the time I could get proof or police show up, there would be no music. I'm deadlocked with my only further option being pretty useless and a waste of time. At this point I'm biding my time and just waiting till something changes. I'm not saying that I condone people who bludgeon their neighbor to death with a rusty pipe, but I do somewhat understand what would drive someone to that point. The mistake. One day I'm at home and I notice quite a lot of ruckus next door, more so than usual. Suddenly, I see through my garden window that a wall is being partially torn down. You see, sometime over the years, the neighbors had built a small adjacent side building adjoining the main house. It was right on the border between us, and when the gardens were being refenced, the wall was used as a divider to save on fencing. Said wall was now in the process of having its top part ripped off by a crane. 
I was not informed of any of this, which, while not technically needed, would have been the nice thing to do. I go take a walk so I can take a look at what we're doing and see that they've torn down the entire side building. The remaining wall between our gardens is the only part that has been kept intact, and even then, not the top part. Being a lawyer, and specifically, a construction, permit lawyer, I know two things, one. Shit like this is not allowed without a pre-approved permit from the city too. There is no way in hell they have said permit, as I would have seen the application for it. I regularly check to see what permits are being applied to around my area, just so I can keep up with what is being built or requested in my area. This is it. The moment I have been waiting for, the situation has changed and the time has come to exact revenge. A quick email sent to the municipal authorities lets me do my civic duty of reporting a potential crime, the fact that someone is building or demolishing shit without a permit. Since this is a simple report, no response happens since I'm not an official victim or anything yet. Since no further construction happens for a few days and everything was removed, I assume that was that and they would only tear down the side structure since it was starting to fall apart due to age. Neighbors have moved all their stuff that was in said building onto their lawn and haphazardly covered it with a tarp. The next week, more construction materials are being delivered and construction starts. I send a new email to city services, with new pictures, saying that apparently, there is more planned, and that I hope they undertake the appropriate action. Instant response less than an hour later, they'd called Jack after the first time to inform him that what he was doing required a permit, and he had ensured them that he didn't know that BS, he's in construction, of course he knows, and that he would stop construction and request a permit. They called him again after my email, reprimanded him for not following his earlier promise and he said again he would shut it down. I happened to be working from home that day, and had to stop myself from waving to the construction crew as they left. Later that day I get an angry phone call from Jack, who accuses me of reporting him and that I would be sorry. He would come after me for damages for his delays. I respectfully inform him that even if I reported him, reports are in my name, but not published and anonymized in later files, I wouldn't have done anything wrong, because from the looks of it he didn't have a permit and should have known that before he started working illegally without one. I end the call before I start to sound too happy with things. Jack has at this point, no idea what I have initiated with this. He is Jack Sparrow and I have just rung the bell that awakens the Kraken that will destroy him, he just doesn't know it yet. The Kraken. You see, there is a good reason why most people consult an expert and or a lawyer when they want to apply for a permit. The rules involved are so convoluted and needlessly complex that navigating them as a non-professional is extremely hard and time-consuming, and a single mistake can torpedo your entire case, forcing you to do it all over. I have killed entire projects, and have seen clients' projects killed, by pointing out that on page 127, section 35.1.a, something was left blank that should have been answered. I did some digging and found out that the previous owners of the houses had actually consulted each other about the side building, and agreed on making the wall, part of, the divider between their gardens. So much so, that they shared the costs of it. And the ownership. That wall that he destroyed part of. It was also my wall. Which of course, means I'm entitled to damages, but that is not the important part. The important part is that he needs my permission, to do anything to that wall. So when he applied for a permit a few weeks later, added bonus, rowdy neighbors stuff is still out in the open, covered by just a tarp, since they expected this to be a quick smash and replace job that would take a few weeks at most, I went to city center and looked at the application. Noticed that they were planning to do some stuff to said wall that I own 50%. So I filed a complaint, following proper procedure, about the permit, namely that even if granted, it could never be executed, since Jack needed permission from me in regards to the wall, and he didn't have it, nor was I intending to grant it. This should kill his permit, since permits cannot be granted if you know in advance they cannot be realized. No sense granting a permit to build a certain kind of house when you know they're never actually going to build it. Now, Jack was a bit of a smooth talker, and as a construction entrepreneur, had his connections, and permits are a political decision here just as much as a legal one. So despite a 100% correct legal objection that should have killed his permit, it went through. He actually called me about it to gloat a little. No worry, one can appeal a permit in my country. 
The only requirement is that you pay a 100 euro fee, which I gladly paid. The appeal instance is a subnational instance, and does not care one bit about Jack's political ties or the half-hearted bullshit that the city officials wrote to justify granting the permit in spite of the concerns I raised. They terminate his permit without any hesitation on the aforementioned legal grounds. Jack sees his permit blocked until he fixes the issue, which he can't, because I'm not really inclined to agree with his plans for our wall, you see. At this point, going through two lengthy procedures, it has been over seven months. The neighbors have had an unfinished construction project in their yard the entire time, forced to store their stuff elsewhere. Something that was always supposed to be a temporary thing for a few weeks while we build, turned into something that was taking months, with no end in sight. But wait, there's more. The above was the administrative part of the matter, him getting the permit. Now doing construction work without a permit is also a criminal offence. And of course, my report got passed around to the appropriate instances, so now Jack was also the subject of a criminal procedure for construction offence. Not only did he risk fines and jail time, he was a construction business and used his own construction business for the work he did on the property. So his company was also on the hook, and one of the sentences that can be given in these types of crimes is to be prohibited to do construction or construction-related activity as a business, either permanently or temporarily. Not only was he personally on the line, his entire business was as well. During this debacle, Jack tried to sell the property. This didn't really go too well because of a few reasons. 1. The property was inflicted with an illegal situation, the demolished side building was torn down illegally, and until said illegal status was resolved, it would stick to the property. Which tends to kill the property value quite a bit, since nobody wants to buy something that they'll have to spend time and money on to make legal again by either rebuilding the torn down building, or getting a regularization permit for it made even worse by the fact that he applied for said permit and had it denied, so he couldn't even claim that said permit would be super easy to get. Secondly, is Jack never intended to sell the property in its current state. What he, as I now know, has done in the past is buy cheap old houses like the one next to me. He puts some of his crew in it, who can't complain about the subpar accommodation. They thrash the place because they don't care and he lets them, then when the place is done, he tears it down and sells it to a developer or develops it himself. However due to his construction crime and the accompanying status for the property, step two was not an option. He couldn't renovate it the way it needed to be, small renovations would not be enough, because covering the crime was always a requirement in any permit he would request for the building, and because of me, he couldn't cover it couldn't sell it either, because the place was trashed, and any developer looking at it would dip out when they realized there was a construction issue and a vocal neighbor who would oppose anything big that they would try to do there, lost of easier properties to develop than that one. In conclusion. Anyway, that is where we are today. Jack is staring down the barrel of a criminal court procedure that is about to happen where he is risking his business and livelihood. His existing projects also gather special attention from city services now, since he is now outed to them as someone who cuts corners on permits and regulations. He cannot really sell the property unless he cuts a massive loss, since in its current state it is absolutely trashed. He cannot develop it or sell to a developer because all development plans involve the adjoining wall, which he cannot use in big ways unless he gets my permission. The rowdy neighbors are stuck living in a smaller house than what they had, in a place they trashed but that cannot really be renovated or fixed in the major way that it needs. They have quieted down a lot, possibly because Jack blames them for his current situation, which isn't wrong, I suppose. I have awakened the Kraken and set it off on Jack Sparrow, and it utterly ruined him. And the best part is that I had due to very little to do it. All I really did was nudge the abomination that is municipal bureaucracy and pointed in his direction, and they did the rest. I could tell you that he called me to complain and even beg about letting him use the wall the way he needs it to, so that he can get on with his business and fix the issues and use them to show his good faith in court in the criminal procedure, that he was losing money and customers over this and was in danger of losing his entire business. And that I then smugly replied with, not my ducking problem. But he didn't, so for now we'll just have to imagine that he did. Last one is titled, A Love Life Ruined Because of Being a Moocher. I, female 50s, had a friend, Mary, female 53, whom I knew for a long time. 
Our so-called friendship taught me that some people will just use you until you are dry of your resources. I liked her because she had a very sweet facade. At the time, I was recovering financially and emotionally from a bad relationship where my ex wiped my bank account, tried to kill my cat, and gave my car to his mother. I went from a high-paying job to doing anything that kept me from homelessness because I needed to bring myself to safety. And that included leaving town and leaving my old job behind, at least until I could find a suitable transfer. So Mary was the type of friend you like but can be a bit overbearing and clingy. However, I was forgiving because she used her childhood as an excuse. When she knew about my situation, she asked to move in and be housemates so that she could save and move out in six months. I could show the extra cash. She would contribute to the groceries. There was third girl, Kay, on the same terms. It was all great at first. But then, she just became a parasite who stole our food, stole from the pantry to cook for her boyfriend's family to suck up to them, and stopped paying rent. She knew my situation, so I asked her to leave. It was not just that she wasn't paying rent, but she also became an expense. First, she kept buying time, then she refused to leave. In the meantime, things got out of hand. She blatantly used our stuff and dessert would disappear at the blink of an eye. She would just take the whole thing and give it to her boyfriend. And she never paid for groceries. So, Kay and I hollowed out a chocolate cake and filled it with plain vanilla frosting. We just wanted to reduce the cake so she would be embarrassed. It wasn't there when we came home. Mary was all upset the next morning but she never said anything. We cooled it for a while when she promised she would move out. But then, she went out for the weekend and came back home claiming she had spent all her money on an emergency surgery for her boyfriend's sister. Facebook said she treated them to a camping weekend. We confronted her and she became violent. We called the police and nothing happened. It got worse, because tenant laws can be very complicated and getting rid of her wasn't as easy. She had a fight with her so-called future mother-in-law. His family never accepted her because she was older than their son. At this point, we had to lock our bedrooms and I had no peace of mind because I'd already suffered my pet being at risk. So I kept my eyes wide open and my cat inside the bedroom. Mary was a bully. So Kay and I baked lasagna and put rackfisk trout. That is a canned fish that can smell like poop because of fermentation. We added some fur off a Hobby Lobby shop and mixed and twisted it to make it look like roadkill. We put it inside the lasagna, then covered it with another layer of pasta. It looked like a rat inside a dish. The idea was for that shit to be found whenever they cut the lasagna. The putrid smell is actually very potent. We wanted to embarrass her, but we never expected that the tension between her and the guy's family would do the rest. Hours later, Mary barged in with him in tow, and they were having a heated argument. He said the lasagna, carcass, was not a prank from anyone who wanted to, because trouble, and that it looked like a veiled threat against his mum, like a mafia style, sleeping with the fish's warning. Mary tried to get us involved and force us to explain, but we just denied everything. Kay wrote his mother a message via Facebook, introduced herself and purposely told her how sorry she felt that she had to experience Mary's wrath. She then warned her to be safe and attested to Mary's violent character. Mary's boyfriend stopped coming by after this and only showed up to force her to return his car keys. In the meantime, her ex's mother kept posting, good riddance, memes. I flushed down her house key and when she asked for a copy, I told her we would only under contract and that she would need to pay what she owed. Presto. She ran off like a bat out of hell after three days of having to knock on the door and being forced to wait in the hallway. Thanks for listening.